Okay, so welcome um, to Soundscape Roundtable. And today we'll be featuring uh, Soundscape alumni throughout the decade. Uh, we have four alumni with us in the room. We have um, Glad um, Kanasevich, Glad. Then we have Amanda uh, Debor. We have Curtis Ramrill and we have Catherine Schumeister. So I, I will ask each of you to um, tell us um, your experience at Soundscape. Maybe first start by telling us when you were there and um, what you took away was and activities that you've been doing since we met um, years ago at Soundscape. So um, just no particular order. Can I start with uh, Glad, please? Hi. <clears throat> yeah, so I went to Soundscape as a participant back in 2011, um, uh, just as a performance participant, um, and then came back as a visiting artist in uh, 13, 14, and 15. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, yeah, the 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 first experience was uh, was over. It was it was pretty overwhelming. It was I think the first festival that I've done. I ha I haven't really um, done any. Um, definitely no uh, no festivals as a student. I would. Uh, I think I think I did a few things just being a part of an ensemble that would play student works or or something like that. But. Um, somehow um it all felt like such a novelty to me like um just being from from eastern europe there were a lot of things that i didn't think that were like exactly really possible and i know i was kind of late to the game um but i started figuring out that there are things that you can do that are not at your university <laughs> or at your school uh, that are kind of everywhere, and you can just go on Google and find them. Um, it, I know it sounds like such a simple thing, but uh, it, it was not so simple to figure out, and it, it just required a few friends that I've made um, in my undergrad to just like kind of drop names, and then getting used to the whole auditioning, the the whole selection, the whole application process. That was that was a totally totally wild. Uh, kind of thing to adapt to, and uh, it took me a couple of years to actually start to understand how to properly do it. Um, so um, yeah, so I think I was uh, I was a senior in my performance program when I, uh, when um, when I came. Actually, I, I think I just graduated. Right, I just graduated um, from from Peabody, um, and um, I mean I'm I met so many people that I'm still in touch with today. Uh, that year, it was. Uh, I'm. I'm sure every everyone in every year feels that way. But uh, but I'm in touch with. I've worked with. I've seen Curtis. Curtis was one of the last people I've seen, and played probably played for before everything shut down. So um, uh, I've uh, I've seen him in February of last year, and um, so yeah. So I I work with uh, with people on and off still. That's great. I don't know. We'll, we'll come back for more. Let's uh, go to Amanda. Hi, uh, I was a participant in Soundscape in 2008. And that was um, after the first year of my master's degree, I'd gone to Buffalo to study with the one and only Tony Arnold and saw a Soundscape poster on the wall of Buffalo and asked, like, should I do this? And she said, yeah. So went to Italy and drank a bunch of limoncello and sang a bunch of new music. And I, during my, a lot of undergrads are this way, but I, it, I had to come to new music on my own. It wasn't necessarily encouraged. So Soundscape was one of the first immersive experiences where I was just totally doused in contemporary music and I was in heaven just being surrounded by composers and all that and other like-minded performers. And it was one of the things that inspired me to start my own festivals after that. And I, um, so I've started a few different kinds of events and now I run a festival of my own in Omaha, Nebraska. And Soundscape was one of the things that really set off that, um, that thought and inspired me. Um, so 
And I've been singing with a couple different chamber, contemporary chamber music ensembles as well since then. Thank you. Um, Curtis. Hey, I'm Curtis. Uh, so I was also a participant in uh, 2011, uh, uh, along with Gleb and, and Amanda was faculty uh, uh, that year. Gleb and I were roommates. Uh, uh, spent spent a lot of time together, uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was actually a very uh, I, I think I I don't know if this was common to every year, but it was a really transformative experience I think for a lot of us, uh, and uh, and those relationships have continued. Uh, uh, Amanda and I went to to Bowling Green together, but we didn't really know each other. Uh, until Soundscape, I think. Uh, and uh, we've worked together many times over the years since then. Uh, uh, I met uh, uh, a friend who uh, wasn't able to be on this call, Andres Carrizo, uh, who won the Composition Prize in 2011 and, uh, and came back the next year. I came back the next year as well in 2012. And uh, and he and I just just immediately upon meeting each other knew that 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 our lives were somehow linked. We actually we they they were the their family was the first people that we went and visited as as this pandemic started to to uh, let up. Um, and uh, the second year, he said uh, at the end of the festival, he said, "Hey, do you want to?" He, he's from Panama. He said, "Do you want do you want to start a festival in Panama?" Uh, yeah, I said, sure. Yeah, that sounds fun. Um, and uh, uh, Amanda came to that, Gleb came to that, Tony came to that, Ayun came to that. Uh, uh, so I, I ran a festival in Panama for, for a few years. Uh, I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for a while and, and uh, I helped run a, a performing organization and ensemble there called Alia Musica. Uh, 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 and currently, I am a doctoral student at uh, Berkeley, uh, California, uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and Gleb and Amanda have also uh, both come out to, to perform uh, at Berkeley in the last few years. So uh, it's been uh, the, the connections have been have been really significant in our lives. Thank you for that. We'll come back to more questions about the festival, but let's go to Catherine. Hi, um, I was first a participant in Soundscape in 2018, I believe, so pretty recently. And um, I was excited to come out. I was already in my doctorate at UCSD, so already pretty deep into contemporary music. Um, but I was really excited, especially to work with you again, Ayun, because at McGill, you're one of the most amazing professors. So I was super excited to have another opportunity to work with you. Um, and I had such a great time playing in all these different variations and meeting all these great people. And, and one of the things that I really love about Soundscape is it's this intimate community where you really get to know everyone and you get to spend all day with everyone. And even, um, so I, I attended as a participant in 2018 and then I was a visiting artist in 2019. And from both summers, I've done other collaborations since then. In, in 2018, there was an artist, uh, there was an ensemble in residence from from Spain, Vertice Sonora, and I thought they were so incredible. And so I reached out to their artistic director and I said, hey, I'd love your group, amazing program, amazing musicians. And then it worked out that I actually went out, went to Portugal and Spain and did a tour with them the next year. And during the pandemic, I've collaborated with uh, Dylan Del Giudice, um, a fabulous young composer and guitarist that I met in 2019 at Soundscape. So even in this short time, I've done um, collaborations post Soundscape. So really grateful to be here. Thank you. Um, so let's go back to maybe Curtis and Amanda. And can I get you guys to speak more about uh, doing festivals? Let, let's go back to Curtis because you did a festival in Panama. So, so that's probably extra event, well, adventurous in terms of organization and just getting stuff off the ground. Uh, Tony, Tom and I, and also Nathaniel, we were there at the same time. We were just so impressed with how you guys did this and did this actually 
mostly remotely, but all the all the organization actually happen offsite and everybody just gathered together in Panama. Can you just kind of walk us through that experience? Sure. Um, uh, so we did a, a, a festival in Panama in 2013 and a festival in Panama in 2015. Uh, and uh, the festival uh, was uh, uh, focused on, you know, it was, it was basically uh, 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 a soundscape for specifically Latin American composers. Uh, 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 the first year we brought uh, Ensemble Dalmiente uh, uh, with Amanda uh, to be the featured ensemble uh, uh, and then uh, worked with also a young uh, ensemble in Panama called Paisage. Uh, and uh, I, I would say uh, Michael from, from uh, 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 Dalmiente sort of put it best at, at the end of the second festival. He looked at us and he just said, "Wow, you two, you just kind of put your heads down and 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 make a festival." And and that was really the experience of it of of just uh, you know the the especially the first time uh, not really knowing what we were doing, uh, but uh, uh, having this idea. And you know, the first festival, Andres is from Panama and was able to go there for a few months and uh, and do a lot of the groundwork ahead of time. So it was a lot of you know us remotely uh, planning and doing call for, calls for scores and brainstorming what could be cool ideas. Uh, and then getting there and just sort of trying to prevent anything from going wrong. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the second festival, uh, we were a little bit more deliberate about, uh, in part, uh, Andres had just had a kid, uh, uh, so he didn't have the, the sort of flexibility to, you know, just drop everything and, and devote his entire life to the festival. We hired uh, uh, his sister, uh, who is uh, uh, an arts administrator, uh, to uh, do a lot of the groundwork. Uh, uh, and... <laughs> you know, definitely lost money on the entire endeavor, but uh, 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 we put on a bigger festival the, the next year, had had the Soundscape Trio uh, plus Nat come uh, in addition to Dalmiente, had Paisage again, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think that, you know, that the the second festival was, was uh, uh, a, a little bit larger uh, affair, but uh, uh, still had the the just general uh, chaos of, oh, okay, how do we find the only five octave marimba uh, in Panama? Uh, oh, I guess we, we we discovered that there's an 18 year old kid out in the country that that happens to own a five octave marimba, so we're gonna go and 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 just beg and borrow it. Uh, um, so I, I honestly, it was largely just. Uh, 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 deciding that it was going to happen and then figuring out how to do it, which is I think how most things happen in the arts is you decide that if somebody else can you do it, you can probably figure it out too. That's very true. Thank you for that. Um, so Amanda, can, can you tell us about your festival? I have not been to your festival yet, so uh, I'm eager to learn more about it. Yeah, yeah. I. Um, the festival I currently run is called Omaha Under the Radar. Omaha is my hometown, <clears throat> and I moved back here in 2012. Before that, I was running a festival for three years in Madison called the Colorfield Festival, and that was a complete failure. It just was terribly organized, poorly funded, and underattended. So <laughs> all the things went wrong, and that was great <clears throat> because I learned a lot from that. And I learned... Um, a lot about just the sort of behind the scenes, nitty gritty, how to make a spreadsheet kinds of things that really come in handy. All the boring stuff that people don't wanna do, which is how events actually happen. So um, learned how to write grants and that type of thing. So I was really glad for that experience. And then when I moved back to Omaha, I decided to move my efforts back here. There's not a lot of contemporary and experimental music in Omaha. So one of our goals is to increase those offerings and to encourage people who live here to try new things, bring people in from the outside and create new um, avenues for collaboration. 
Um, it's usually an application festival and it's just like three or four days of performances. And yeah, running a festival is basically just chaos management. There's so many artists all in one place and trying to keep everyone happy and supported in the way that they need. So it's been, I love it. I love that kind of thing. I put all my sort of like motherly instincts into it and um, that works out well here in Omaha and the audience is hungry for this kind of thing here so um, people people appreciate it so yeah we've been doing this Omaha under the radar this will be our eighth festival coming up this August and um, I'm I, I I can't think off the top of my head but I know that there have been soundscape people here Liz Purse has performed on it and yeah so there have been soundscape people all over this festival and um, so it's, it's really fun to see all those collaborations come back. And yeah, the Panama Festival was super fun. Um, they did a great job. I mean, as performers, you don't really see all the behind the scenes chaos. So I'm sure it was more stressful than they made it look. I just remember that it would be like 90 degrees and humid outside and then like 58 degrees inside wherever we went. And so I was just so, I was just so cold all the time whenever we were there, but it was a really great festival. <laughs> I remember the Panama Canal, and I love that, my trip to the canal. Um, um, so are you the only person who is in charge of the festival? Are you a one person festival or do you have help? It's, it's mostly me. My co-organizer, Stacy Borellos, does all the education stuff. So we have a five day workshop that leads up to the festival for adults who want to explore experimental music and it's usually people who um, a lot of them don't have music experience and things like that and so we do a lot of like deep listening and improvisation and impro uh, instrument building that kind of thing um so Stacy runs that and helps with some of the operation stuff and then I have an, another friend Aubrey Byerly and she um she helps me with the sort of finance stuff doing the taxes and, and that kind of thing and um so we have this sort of team of three that runs it and then we've been working with the same tech director every year fred gifford who's a composer based in chicago and one of my dear friends and so he helps us with the technical side of things um but i would i would yeah most most of the sort of primary organizing is is me amazing so Cled, tell us about the many careers that you have and that you're so great at from composing to playing the clarinet and maybe there are other hidden talents that that I have not discovered. Um, well, my recent project and uh, as I'm sure it was the case for, for many um, who have been derailed um, last year, um, there was well, for for one thing, being like kind of a searing aerosol can is not particularly good. Um, I can't, you know, there's no way to cover. I mean, we have those body bags, I guess, but you know, it's it's uh, that's that's not a thing. But um, I've been, I kind of shifted my efforts uh, more to listening, curating, and uh, doing things. Maybe doing collaborative things but maybe helping other people out um in this past year and um i guess it was um it's kind of a small initiative and it, it it doesn't really pay people a whole lot but um i'm hoping it's going to develop into um just a larger platform but um i started a community label type of thing called unknown tapes where um i basically transformed my personal band camp with uh, a relatively large mailing list uh, into a label um, account. And I'm sort of building up on that slowly right now. Um, but um, I want it to be a platform for, uh, for artists that kind of have something to do with spontaneous music making. It's not necessarily improvisation. It's not necessarily new music. I want it to be kind of on the fringes of sort of everything. Um, but uh, the kind of work that doesn't seem to work out or get enough attention or at least get enough traction in, in terms of, um, I don't know, just purchases, listens, um, 
just some kind of attention that I really wanted to provide a space for. Um, and just kind of digging through my stacks and, uh, and buying more and more things and listening to more and more things um, last year, uh, I came across so many people that I've realized were influential locally. Um, just we see them play all the time. They, they seem to gig all the time and you think that they make money. They actually don't. Um, most of them either have day jobs or they're broke or something, but they've influenced a lot of uh, new, uh, whether it's new music people or popular, uh, popular music people or jazz players. Uh, they've been highly influential and yet the, some of them don't even have a release out. And that kind of, um, that really hit me hard. Um, and I wanted to put out a few things that you know, I'm slowly working through. One of the people have, has unfortunately passed away from COVID complications last March, um, in March, 2020. So this is like a posthumous release that I'm, that I'm, that I'm putting out. Um, and, um, I'm sort of working with all different formats. Um, I'm not just doing vinyl. I'm not just doing tape. I did a release on micro cassettes because it was a spoken word release and it actually kind of worked out really nicely, but, um, uh, you know, I, I spent a bunch of time, um, on eBay trying to track down like accessibly priced, uh, dictaphones. Um, and you know, some of the things came in bundles and, um, you know, because, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of, um, a little nitpicky with obsolete media and I don't just like want to say it to, to, to sell obsolete product that uh you know no one's going to play but if i also sell a few bundles maybe i can keep um releasing things on micro cassette if they sound good on it so it's usually it's the medium that really caters uh that that really goes hand in hand with the music um so uh so that's been that's been kind of a large uh undertaking um while while things were shut down so um in between uh, some audio engineering and, uh, you know, putting together remote choirs and orchestras and all that kind of stuff. Um, this, this was, this was a passion project for, for the last year. That sounds amazing. So you are kind of taking stuff that's currently residing on band camp and transforming them into other formats and allow different communities to hear the music. Well, uh, it, it doesn't exist any, uh, well, it exists on the band cap that I made for this, but, um, but it doesn't like most of this stuff doesn't exist anywhere. Some of it was made, uh, especially for unknown tapes because I've reached out to these people. Um, some of the material has been recorded and produced already, just not released. Um, some of it has been released unsuccessfully, uh, let's say in Argentina. Um, and, you know, I just kind of um, try to modernize the platform and maybe put it out on other media and uh, work with um, bloggers, uh, critics, um, some local rec uh, record stores and try to do some sort of distro because um, a lot of this fringe music, it's, uh, there's also so much of it digitally that um, I think I, I had to budget for the element of, um, of that surprise find, um, something, something tangible, something that, uh, someone can just accidentally stumble upon in, in a record store. Um, and, uh, a part of, uh, the whole physical medium, uh, apart from the fact that a lot of people started doing that because they were craving something tangible, um, in this time, um, at least in New York City, record stores were the only place that was remotely social that was open during the pandemic. Um, and uh, it was like a place where you could mask up, you can put on the gloves and stuff. And, you know, there's like a limit of three people at a time, de depends on the size of it. But uh, that was about as close to going to, you know, like, a bookstore, a book, bookstores were largely cl close too. That was that was also the crazy thing. But that was the, the the closest thing I could find to like a coffee shop, you know, where I can sort of or or going to a bar 
where I could semi-anonymously hang out, you know, while doing something else and uh, engaging with something that I was interested in. So, um, Thank you for that. So Catherine is our uh, newest member on the Soundscape board, and she's sort of in charge of um, uh, giving alumni a platform for, for, for post Soundscape activities. So she has some ideas to share with us actually. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so, Thank you, Ayun. I'm, I'm really excited to be joining the Soundscape board and, and just sort of thinking about what might be um, useful to Soundscape alumni. Um, I'm hoping to initiate just some different ways that we can connect and support each other and open up uh, pathways for communication, for collaboration. So after the festival, um, please look out. We'll, we'll probably be reaching out to you to maybe do some surveys to see what people might be interested in doing. Some, some ideas that we have are possibly having like a regular um, event series where we can help promote your local events. So we can kind of put out a call and you could submit to us what's going on and we can help um, help promote your event, um, but also raise the profile of Soundscape by um, connecting Soundscape to you and what you're doing. We're also thinking about doing some research um, to figure out geographically where a lot of Soundscape alumni are located, because I know we're all moving around all over the place, but that might be helpful so that perhaps if there are people um, in your area or nearby, you can connect. Um, I, I spoke with Nikki, we were kind of brainstorming dif different ideas. We're thinking about possibly having um, a blog feature on our website where we can connect with alumni and perhaps also do call for proposals for people to propose projects. So um, if, if you have any ideas, please feel free to reach out. You'll probably be hearing from us in the next few weeks or so, but um, I just wanna put it out there that um, I, th I think that, I mean, music is all about community. And so I just want to, um, hopefully facilitate this being an ongoing community that uh, we all can draw from and benefit from. Um, well, actually, can you also tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the base? Because I know you got tons of stuff going on. Sure. Well, it's been such an interesting year because prior to the pandemic, I was kind of all over the place. I was traveling, I think 50% of the time. It was really crazy, really exciting, but really crazy because I was playing with this Australian new music ensemble and freelancing with different ones in US and Europe. And so it was very exciting, but also really a crazy lifestyle to be traveling with a double bass all over the place. <laughs> um, and then during the pandemic, it's actually been, it opened up um, time for me to complete my qualifying exams and my doctorate. So that was really good, but also really um, make time and space for my own improvisation and composition process. Um, so I've been really um, grateful for that time and space. And during my time at UCSD, um, in addition to collaborating with composers and working on all the craziest double bass scores, I've, I've also been really interested in different kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations. So like one of my favorite projects that I've done so far was a, um, a site determined dance music piece at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography on the beach. And so now going forward into the final stage of my degree, I'm actually, I reached out to an organization in San Diego called San Diego Coast Keeper, and they're, de they're dedicated to the environmental sustainability and health of waterways in San Diego. And so I'm talking to them about putting together a concert series that somehow is bringing together like awareness and neighborhood cleanups and, and doing sites determined concerts in coastal inland and urban environments. So that's what I'm like currently trying to work on. And it's, it's very scary and overwhelming and I don't know what I'm doing, but I also know that I really want to push myself to um, think about all the different ways that I could just connect the different things that are important to me. So, um, so that's what I'm currently working on in this like final stage of my doctorate. That's great. So I think at this point, I think we're ready to open up for questions or comments or other topics for discussion. Victor. Oh, no.
Bueno. Evan, please. Oh, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> sure. I, I can, I can ask a question. Um, I suppose. So my, my question comes from a place of be, so I, um, I don't live in an area where there's a ton going on per se, uh, even before the pandemic. I mean, there's, I, I'm, I'm based in St. Louis and there's, there's stuff but I, my, I went to a very small liberal arts college just in the area, kind of out of the way, and I, it was pretty self-contained. And, um, and then later in my uh, undergraduate career, I started uh, getting more involved with the wider artistic community. And I'm, my goal now is, as I'm here at Soundscape and I've done a couple other things, I'm trying to get more involved with the wider community and particularly I'd like to be involved with the community that I have where I live. Um, I guess my question is what is the best way to go about like finding and meeting people just in your area as things are starting to open up now so with which is good and uh, especially in my area the vaccination rate is pretty high um, I've been getting into more gigs and such, but, um, I don't, I don't know how, how do you go about meeting people and <laughs> inserting yourself into the community? I have a lot of thoughts about this being in a pretty similar city to St. Louis. Omaha is smaller, but I think they have a lot in common. Um, obviously, you can look and look at folks who are at the university. There's probably people there, but I started going to jazz shows and um, indie rock shows and things of that nature, and uh, just trying to collect all the weirdos in town. Usually, if you go to a show that has three bands on it, there's going to be one person in one of the bands that you have a sense about. It's like this person is probably strange and I'm gonna be friends with them. So you just try to get a sense for that by, by finding the galleries that like, I, I find that if there's music happening at a non-traditional space, that's a good sign. Um, just going to a lot of shows. Um, it, this is not always the case because I know a lot of us on this probably do or have taught at a university, but I sometimes find that the university folks don't necessarily want to collaborate outside the university. They're so busy. They're so bogged down with committees. It's just like, you want me to do another thing? Sorry, forget about it. So I like to just go to a lot of shows. And um, what I would do also is just contact a lot of these galleries and art spaces, DIY spaces directly and just say, hey, do you have any sense of who would be interested in this kind of thing? Um, it's really hard to penetrate underground scenes, um, but they exist everywhere you go. And that, that was really the, the starting point um, for me in Omaha was to just find the folks who exist on the fringe there and start little projects. I, I would, my approach has been similar uh, uh, I've moved to a lot of different places in the last 10 years, last 20 years, really. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, the place that we spent the most time in, uh, 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 over the last decade was Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, 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 I, I moved there for a, uh, job, uh, uh, with a labor union. So it wasn't music related. Uh, uh, but, you know, being a composer is, is still my primary identity, even when it doesn't pay me. Uh, and, uh, uh, I knew one, two musicians in Pittsburgh, uh, when I moved there, uh, before we moved there. Uh, and, uh, when we were thinking about moving there, we, we, uh, you know, just went out for coffee and talked about what the music scene was like. And, uh, uh, 
you know, in in these smaller cities, uh, uh, there's, you know, always still people doing really good work. And uh, uh, my approach was just to to meet the people that were doing the work, and then uh, find ways that my skills could be useful to them, uh, and to try to to build that community. Uh, you know, working with the people that are that are already there, uh, and uh, 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 you know, Pittsburgh. Like, I think there's a, a lot to be said for uh, smaller places that have really committed scenes, because you know, there's this there's this sense. I feel at least that it's a bunch of people that that have just decided that if they don't do it nobody's going to do it uh and uh i think that the the community can be a lot tighter uh than in bigger places where it's you know a, a lot of people trying to become famous or whatever um and uh uh you know you you can end up with uh relationships that are you know maybe less transactional and more uh based in real uh friendship and collaboration uh and yeah, I mean, I think I think living in Pittsburgh has been one of the most important things for for my creative life, uh, uh, because uh, the uh, the collaborations that came out of there. I mean, you know, I I had an ensemble uh, commission me for an opera, and that wouldn't have happened, I think, in a in a bigger place because you know there's all sorts of famous composers that you can commission for an opera that aren't me. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, you know when it when it when it really is your community and and you're seeing uh, uh, you know people that you have long term important relationships with uh, over the years uh, the the dynamic is different and I I would you know I think I think I don't know St Louis I've I've I I, I I don't know that scene but uh, uh, I think you know Omaha is a, is a great example of a place that that you know it's amanda and and folks just making something happen the cool thing about living in a small scene too is that like uh i feel like there's less hierarchy in terms of like what kinds of music get programmed like there's less sort of a weight placed on certain names certain historic names or certain important musics um so Programming is like you can take a, the different kinds of risks in these smaller communities and the payoff is, is totally different. Um, people have a different appreciation for it because it happens less often. People are less jaded. My audience that comes to my events are so thrilled whenever something like this is happening. And it can be really um, rewarding if you, if you are able to somehow invest in the community with your time and money. And I, I found that like being in Omaha and hang out with people who are outside of the contemporary classical music genre, it like encouraged me to take different risks that I might not have taken if I was always on the sort of academic festival route. I can also add that in, I, I, I'm from Hawaii and I lived there for a few years, um, like when I was out of school and I started to play with a number of different jazz groups. And, and actually in these intimate settings, sometimes I would just play a Henza solo or Elliot Carter solo in the middle of a, of a jazz set, but it was actually really well received because I think people were there were here there to listen to creative music making and it was it was really interesting and I actually think that being in Hawaii allowed me to do that. I don't know if I would do that in a different place like living in Chicago or Montreal or something. So and it can be very interesting. I mean, you also experience the music. It feels very different to play Elliot Carter in that context than in a concert hall or something. So um, I, I definitely echo what what everyone else has been saying. Great. Well, let's take another question. Caroline. Hi. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> right as I'm gonna ask a question, I inhaled kombucha. Okay. Um, I am wondering about, it's the thing that probably we all hate to talk about, but have to talk about, um, finding people who have a lot of money and they really wanna give you that money to make your things happen that take money. 
<laughs> I, I I like how the dog already barked out the comment. He also yeah. wants That's to know. About yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect timing. No, my first instinct with that is always to just be building authentic relationships with people, whether they have money or not. And obviously, we need to meet with people with money. But whether someone's going to give you five dollars or five thousand um, dollars, it really all comes down to the relationship that you've built with them over time. Now, I have found that it takes a long time for some relationships to develop, um, and so, like, it, there is a point when you do have to say, like, would you consider giving the festival or whatever you're fundraising for a thousand dollars? There is that that point when that does usually need to happen, um, but by the time you say it, it should feel really natural to say it in a way because you have such a relationship with that person. Um, and it's like almost the same as the previous answer where it's just being present in the community and showing your commitment to whatever you're doing and to the people around you. And when you demonstrate that and build that trust with the people around you, um, then all of it feels a lot more authentic and less just gross and ugh, terrible. Um, and there are some people who will string you along and just like hanging out with artists and are never gonna give you any money. And that can be, that can feel exploitative in its own way so just like getting a sense for that from people don't let them string you along but just recognizing that for some people it takes them a long time to get to know you and trust you and trust what you're working on um yeah that's my advice there I will say something. I mean, I think I've been doing some fundraising for different organizations in the next while, in the last while for Soundscape for this project that I was a producer with uh, Soul Percussion and Nexus. Um, and then also with different types of grant writing. Um, it's much easier to fundraise for other people than for oneself. Like if I needed money, I don't think I could ever ask. But but if the money was not for me, the money is for uh, scholarships or if the money is to do a project that doesn't benefit me, I can ask anyone because I don't feel hurt when they say no. So so I think there, there there's a little bit of a trick there. So, so now I can produce events for other people and I'm not directly benefiting because when I'm producing events for other people, I don't feel like if I get turned down, my ego is hurt. Um, but I, I would say that over the past 10 years, I have figured out grant writing. And if it's a grant that I can write, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can get it at some point, maybe not the first try, probably the second try. And if it's a grant, that I don't want to write, I know who can write it for me and can and I can still get that grant. So it has to do with recognizing where your talent is and when to ask for help. And so I think having some sort of community, you know, people that you wanna play with, but also people that you recognize along the way that are going to be good at something that eventually you will, you will need or want to collaborate with. Remember them because you need many different kinds of talents to get something going like what we have here in Soundscape. The and, other thing I'll say really quickly, sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Is as you're getting to know people who want to support you if, and you start to understand them, you try to figure out what they're getting out of it because what do they what do they want are do they just love to be around artists do they want to see their community flourish do they like having their name on things do they like feeling appreciated maybe all of the above and if people do support you in some way whether it's financially or not just really always showing your gratitude immediately because that um that's so important and I've given to things and no one ever thanked me and it just feels like hey that ten dollars meant a lot to me <laughs> so it's always showing appreciation and understanding what is important to the people who are supporting you and um, finding ways to 
you know, make it an exchange. Yeah, I, I was actually going to mention that Amanda is really great at thank yous with with like anytime I give money to something Amanda's doing, I always get a like a a personal email uh, 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 that feels really genuine. Uh, it feels good when people support. It's like any. It's really always shocking to me. They're like, "Wow, they, someone cares about this besides me." So yeah, and and even if you think it in your head, you have to take the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that that uh, has been effective for me in the various projects that we fundraise for is, and this is not this is not big donors. Uh, uh, I've I have never been particularly successful with getting the thousand dollar checks from people I've, I've a, a couple times and it was always people that I had a personal relationship with uh, uh, but uh, you know usually when you're working on a project you've got a, a, a group of people that are invested in the project hopefully right whether it's your board or whether it's the ensemble that's that's uh, putting it together and uh, uh, we took a really deliberate uh, approach to fundraising of, of like we would get together and everybody would make a spreadsheet of uh, the people that they were going to reach out to uh, and uh, you know share our draft emails uh, with each other so that we could see the way we were framing things, help each other write those uh, fundraising emails. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 you know, brainstorm deep into our network of who the people that might be interested in supporting us uh, would be. That might even be, uh, you know, people that we haven't been in contact with in 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 a while. But uh, uh, you know, we know that they're they're interested in this kind of thing or or care about it for some reason. Um, and uh, uh, and then we. You know, had systems of accountability for each other. Where, where, when we would start the fundraising raising drive, we would uh, then meet and and check in and you know make sure that everybody had sent their emails. You know, if we were if we were texting people or calling people, uh, uh, make sure that 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 people were doing it because some of that stuff can be uncomfortable, right? Uh, and uh, and figuring out how to do it in a way that that doesn't violate your relationships with the people that you're asking for money that that you know gives them the opportunity to to say no or just not uh, uh, give if that's what they're comfortable with or what they can afford. Uh, but uh, also, you you can't you can't put on uh, uh, you know you can't make your projects happen without money, and uh, so it, it is really important and meaningful. Uh, when people do give you that money. Um, so getting over that, that you know, and, and I think it helps to do it in a group, right? Uh, to get everybody over the uncomfortability of uh, sending that email. Uh, uh, but, you know, if you've got six, eight, 10 people uh, uh, fundraising their own personal networks, and a lot of the donations come from people that really what they care about is you, right? Uh, they care about the fact that you're doing a thing and they and they have twenty five dollars that they can send you. And if you've got six, eight, ten people doing that, you know, it's not that hard to to raise five, six thousand uh, dollars in a fundraiser because everybody is just uh, and, and it mostly you know is coming from smaller donations. Great. I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. Uh, Logan. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, so I'm just wondering, maybe from like an artistic or like project design standpoint, like how do you go about figuring out like what projects to design, like matching your interests with like the interests of your organization, with like figuring out what a community needs, um, and like how do you you know, brainstorm on what you think you want to get started. Do you, do you mean um, like within an existing organization, what specifically to do within the organization or like starting something from scratch? 
Yeah, I think within an organization that exists already with people that you know, um, like I think it can be hard to design like a like a nice grant package, like something that can be marketable um, and like figuring out how it like, you know, what to do. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that can be really tough, especially when like with my vocal ensemble quince, the four of us do align a lot, but sometimes we're just on different planets in terms of what, what we're interested in artistically and things like that. And um, I think what it comes down to is finding the trifecta of like something that we're interested in artistically, something we think can get support and something that will set us apart or like that doesn't already exist all over the place already. And sometimes that means that I'm singing music that I'm not super interested in, but I'm singing it with people that I love and respect. And um, so for example, um, we have a program of songs that are based around the American Dust Bowl and the great migration that happened after that. And that came about because I was interested in Woody Guthrie and we knew that there were people who like would support a project like that. So then we were like, okay, well, how can we make this align with what we're interested in as an organization? So a lot of times it just starts with a little kernel of an idea like that. But I would love to hear what Gleb has to say about that because I feel like Gleb is always like five years ahead of everyone else with like your ideas. I'm, I mean, I'm not particularly great at getting money for projects like these. So, you know, <laughs> um, because you're ahead of the rest like... of us. They're <laughs> solid ideas. Uh... I mean, uh, I, I feel like a lot of this, so uh, I guess I can I can pitch in here because uh, I got on board. I was, at first I was a core member of Ensemble Cantata Profana in, in New York, and then I've been upgraded to uh, Associate Artistic Director. And uh, I, I started helping out with programming when sort of the passion for a particular thing that's been um, done for, for a few years has been starting to wane. But um, I mean, for one, um, someone, if, if you really have a passion project, someone somewhere will I'll, probably, is probably going to be interested in it. It's just a matter of like being realistic of where you might find those people because it, not, it might not always be local um, and they're finding the right time to bring a particular project to some sort of audience somewhere. But um, I mean, um, if you're particularly thinking about how to make something that you're really passionate about fitting in locally, um, it's often about examining the terms on which communication in your local community is happening and how to deliver something that communicates something that it, like how to communicate something with what you're passionate about to the people that are around you. Um, because there, there are these, these power, there are these power relationships that exist and, you know, you can't really yell at people, but um, I think it is always possible to deliver something on the, uh, a little bit more on the community's terms. I don't want to say in, in, in term uh, like um in the language like in their language in their way but like um with with the social dynamic that um that you're aware of that exists locally um and uh i don't know i've i've been able to find a way to present something that um my ensemble's board f for example board or um, a large slice of the regular concert goers would have never thought that they would be able not just to enjoy, but maybe to understand and to relate to. Um, and often that also, that, that's also dependent on the context. Um, so it's sometimes it's not about just the one thing, but all these little things that surround it, that the uh, like, it's not even just the marketing, but like <laughs> the little things that make up something that we perceive as marketing. <laughs> um, I'm, I know I'm, this is, this is unbelievably esoteric. 
Um, a part of it that I think you're good at too is finding allies and like finding people who will advocate for you too. Yes. And I think that you have to do that as well. Like <clears throat> if you're, if you're in a community and you want to build a project for something new that introduce something new to the community, if you can find a couple people to get on your side and get behind it, and then they can also be your mouthpiece too. That, that helps as opposed to just like traditional marketing and like what, like figuring out what you're trying to get from it. If you're trying to, like when Quince looks at a project is like, okay, doing David Lang is going to make us popular in this way. Doing something really underground and extreme or whatever, that's going to be good for this community. And you want to do a balance of those things so that you're not getting pigeonholed. Great. This is wonderful thoughts. Um, I think we are kind of out of time for the day. Are there last minute comments? Tony. This is amazing. It's so inspiring. And having known all of you across now decades, <laughs> you know, and having this festival be a, a focal point for that, um, it's, uh, it's enormously not only inspiring, but reassuring that what we're, what, what, we've all been doing, but you know, kind of even look at that generationally, the things that I've invested myself in, in my life are, even if they're, if they're not exactly the same things that you're doing, there's, there's, there's an element of that and the care with which you are bringing your ideas forth into the world is something that I admire and respect and am so proud of. I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of your 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 work and your integrity as people and artists. And I just um it's, it's just been great. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. <laughs>